morning, everyone. Welcome to the third and final Indaba session. I have the pleasure of sort of passing over the mic in this one. I didn't have to organize this Indaba at all, which has been absolutely lovely. And we've got a huge gang here, a conservation gang in the front. Um, so, yeah, it's my real pleasure to hand over to Amber and Anwesha, who've, who've organized all of this. Good luck. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, Adrian. And uh, everyone, welcome to the third and final Indaba, as Tur corrected me, as I was saying it, Indaba, that's not correct. And in the true spirit of an Indaba, we are going to just hang around here casually, make it very casual, candid, and it'll be a discussion. Um, what will this be a discussion about? We will talk about conservation labor. How did we get to think of conservation labor? So some of us got together, myself, Amber, Evgeny, Trishant, and Francis, and we put together this uh, grant proposal, which has been funded by the Norwegian Research Council, where we felt that we have been talking about work uh, that people do who work in conservation, work for conservation, and are affected by conservation. But there's only very little emerging literature that was conceptualizing work through the lens of labor. And then we put our minds together as we do, and we wrote this proposal, which then got funded. But to say that the project has not yet started, we are officially going to start um, in November. And we actually have uh, uh, Evgeny uh, Blustein uh, couldn't make it. However, he sent me some pointers uh, of what he wanted to say about conservation labor. So we are using this forum where first um, each of the people who are part of the proposal we will talk about uh, for less than five minutes. And then we have some of the members of our advisory uh, board, uh, Tour, Libby, and um, Dan, who's sitting far away for some reason. And, <laughs> and then we also have our, we also, the, the proposal also had a peer group who would also support the project and um, we have Takoli and we have Esther joining us. So after we speak, they will provide some reflections and then we really open it up uh, for discussion to learn from you as we go forward. Um, so what I will now do is a very, br and yeah, so if you see our, um, this slide, the middle slide, some of this is from Trushan's uh, PhD work, some of the graphics, he worked with an illustrator, and some very initial ideas of our, uh, this research project was uh, recently published in Current Conservation, and we absolutely love the graphics, so please do check out if you want to know more about this uh, project that's been ongoing. And so um, I now open up the floor, so let's start with Amber. Hi, everyone. Um, my interest in this project, and one reason I'm really excited about it, is of that, of course, co questions about labor and conservation. Um, if we're talking about conservation labor, and we're talking about it in the context in which conservation is so imbricated in markets and market forces, um, I think questions of value are, are really exciting and the opportunity to revisit some questions of value um, around labor, but also around the production of nature and, you know, classic work in, uh, around nature as accumulation strategy, et cetera, et cetera, um, should really be front and center when we're thinking about these things. Um, and uh, I just want to briefly, uh, because the theme of value is what I chose to talk about in relation to the project, I wanted to briefly point to um, what I think are four kind of big, broad areas um, that uh, I look forward to exploring in the context of this project and um, our work going forward. Um, and the first of these is, you know, to understand in the context of financialization and the rise of market environmentalism as an internationally dominant um, kind of conservation paradigm, how labor at different levels of it is itself um, a source of surplus value accumulation. And I think this requires that we revisit a lot of classic assumptions um, associated with labor theory and ideas um, around nature as a basis of value accumulation as well, um, especially in light of changes in the ways that labor is being enrolled in projects um, at different levels and through different technologies and techniques. 
Um, second, I think I think that um, labor is a good lens um, to direct on discourses around community participation, community-led conservation, because quite often um, in our work we find that you know, discourses of community participation or community-led conservation can be a way to mask the fact that projects are depending on a lot of uncompensated labor. And related to this, I think um, we need to explore to what extent projects rely on uncompensated social and ecological care work of communities of place um, that, are, that are productive of new natures, um, but also productive of the sorts of branding that a lot of conservation organizations use to promote um, things like uh, carbon offsets or even when we're talking about um, entanglements between conservation and mining, you know, to promote sustainable mining, et cetera. Um, not to belabor the point. Um, and fourth, um, I think, uh, yeah, this it gives us a good opportunity related to all these things um, to, uh, to look at value struggle in political ecology and, and broaden our views of um, thinking about struggles over forms of value that are at play in conservation settings. Um, you know, the obvious between quantitative values of market environmentalism that view nature as a stock of resources, solutions, or substitutable capitals, and the qualitative values um, and value systems associated with rooted social ecologies. And those are just some things that I'm really excited about. Thank you so much, Amber. So I was thinking I'll very quickly um, say something uh, related. So one thing was that we felt that uh, while our um, understanding of conservation labor related research uh, is quite advanced when it comes to understanding this managerial class of highly educated conservation scientists, practitioners, policy makers, we felt that the role of the conservation working class is highly informal. And that's what we really want to get at, this informal, insecure, your uh, uh, w people working in highly dangerous and exploitative conditions and what that means for their labor. And, uh, and something uh, very striking was we found that uh, there was more attention to animal labor in conservation than human labor. So conceptually, the animal labor was more um, developed. Um, and now, uh, Evgeny actually, who was uh, quite uh, instrumental to writing, sent me some points as to, he said, what he found very interesting and analytically productive for a political ecology and economy of conservation. So uh, he thinks that how some forms of work in conservation displaces other forms of work. And this could be in conservation or elsewhere, because we are in a current um, scenario where we will have an um, exponential increase in protected areas, OECMs with the 30 by 30 and so on. So Evgeny and uh, Connor Kavana, they looked at land use change for climate mitigation to highlight how 1.5 degree climate change model outputs imply a very large scale unprecedented urbanization and rural population in global south to make space for rural areas as vast carbon sinks and within that uh, labor of these people becomes important. Uh, he also says that conservation initiatives may operate in a very similar way because they employ some people to displace other people. So uh, we know that from Tanya Lee's, Lee's work on uh, uh, rendering populations uh, surplus and their economic activities, and so their labor becomes surplus. And the final point he makes is that, that these conservation initiatives may be implemented in the name of classic conservation objectives, but they can also be climate related. So they can be used to generate um, uh, or protect carbon through Red Plus and otherwise such other offset programs in the name of biodiversity offsetting, perhaps also in the spheres of agroecology. And in all these examples, we find conservation labor with displacement effects. So thank you. Um, oh, can I mention yeah. one thing? Oh. Yeah, I would just like to acknowledge the work, um, as, as somebody who's done a lot of work in Madagascar, yeah. the work of um, yeah, Janice Sotokoff and also Ben Nymark on precarious conservation labor and low-wage conservation work um, has been really important to um, informing our approach. And also that there is a whole established uh, sphere of labor in sociology and economics, but we want to use it 
for conservation. So Francis, please. Uh, yep. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Francis Massey at Northumbria University. So I come from this from uh, doing a lot of research kind of on and with rangers, uh, specifically in Mozambique and the kind of highly contested context of rhino and elephant poaching and militarized conservation. Uh, and I, I've spoken to a couple people, I was like, I don't want this to be about militarized conservation, but in some ways, like, kind of has to be a little bit. Um, and it comes from spending a lot of time with rangers and talking to them, and during a lot of my research, realizing a lot of the tensions and things they grapple with is the result of them, of this being their job, um, and the things they have to grapple with, because, you know, they're like, I may not agree with this, but, you know, this is my job. This is what I have to do as a worker. Um, and there was a big tension between kind of what we might call the old guard of rangers and then newer rangers being hired uh, and how they were trained, how they approached the job, who's hiring them. And that was because of this, and I don't want to call it militarization, but this kind of like uh, response or the, the need to, quote, combat wildlife trafficking and poaching. Um, and that kind of anecdotally we know uh, and we've seen as kind of really reshaped who's getting hired as rangers, how they're getting trained, what their work is that they do. And so I'm kind of approaching that and saying, how has this kind of changed what it means to be a ranger and their work? And ultimately, why does that matter for conservation uh, kind of as a project and for conservation outcomes? And the second point where I started thinking about this was during this research, having these reflections of all the stakeholders I was engaging with who are quote unquote kind of working in conservation, I had this moment where I was like, do I even do work on conservation anymore? Because the people I was researching were police, law enforcement, border security, customs, all these, all these people becoming enrolled under the banner of conservation because of this combating wildlife trafficking paradigm and approach. So that's sort of my questions lie uh, kind of in that and sort of who's becoming enrolled in conservation, how do existing people working in conservation, how is their work changing, who's hiring, who's getting trained, who's making decisions, who's managing them, um, but all with the, the kind of outlook of what, what does this mean for conservation as a project and for conservation outcomes. I'll leave it there. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Trishant. Um, I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge. Um, very similar to Francis, my, um, my interest in the project comes from uh, my work, my 14 months of ethnographic field work for my PhD in the Corbett Tiger Reserve in India, uh, where I spent uh, considerable amounts of time with, um, I refuse to call them rangers. Uh, and for me, they are frontline forest workers and forest staff. Um, uh, and one incident that left a uh, kind of a big uh, hole in my heart and plus got me thinking about issues in labor was um, a daily wage forest laborer who, who gets less than um, $10 uh, a, a month uh, for the kind of labor that he does, uh, for a duty that's 24 hours. He said to me that we have a dog, uh, and the dog is part of the canine squad. It's a Belgian Malinois. Um, and the amount of money that the state spends on the dog is almost 100 times more uh, than what I get paid. Um, and that left me really thinking about, you know, the, the issue of, of labor processes in conservation, especially, um, you, know, uh, you know, rangers or forest workers or forest guards have kind of been portrayed as both heroes and villains in, in political ecology. Uh, and I think uh, it's time that we kind of uh, broke this down a little bit. A lot of my work looked at how digital technologies um, in, in conservation are used to also monitor labor processes. Uh, and I found that uh, there are whole kinds of things that are happening there. And there's a lot of work in sociology, as Anvesha was saying, especially in labor studies, uh, uh, from Tayloristic models of control, uh, Harry Braverman's work on labor and degradation, uh, Burowai's work on how this labor resists those kinds of control. Um, there is immense amounts of de-skilling that is happening of this labor with the introduction of technologies like drones and uh, and applications like smart and M stripes in India. But at the same time, there is also empowerment and upskilling. 
Um, and uh, this is what uh, is my interest in the project is that what are technologies doing to these labor processes and also to kind of define what this labor actually means and who are these laborers. Um, rangers is an umbrella term but there are so many people that come under that term. Uh, particularly in India we have forest guards, there are forest watchers, there are elephant mahouts, there are fire watchers, uh, there are game wardens, uh, there are d people in the dog squad, there is the tiger protection force. It's very, very diverse, uh, and I find it quite problematic to kind of club them just together as rangers and look at them from that one perspective angle. So um, that's where my interest in this project comes from. Um, thank you so much. And just like quickly to um, segue into um, the, the discussion, but um, uh, to also mention that uh, when we wrote this project for us, labor was actually going more than people who are just within these conservation spaces as rangers or forest guards or wardens. But we also want to understand what happens when conservation lands are taken over, which used to be, or, or agricultural lands are taken over and then are expanded to be conservation lands, and then how people have to reskill themselves to work in that tourism sector. And where are those kind of investments coming from? So I was, and I did a, a very small pilot before, you know, I was given some funding to actually do a pilot before this a little bit and then I was in Kenya and I was talking to these people in the lodges and I said what did you do before you started working in the lodge and almost all of them said we used to be farmers before but now because of COVID or you know things drying up we have come and started working here and I was like but what skills did you get from being a farmer to being a cook in a lodge from being a farmer to doing hospitality in a lodge and there often aren't enough avenues for them to get that kind of skilling there is no investments uh, being made and Tour can speak uh, more to that kind of the transition that is going on and this is also being linked to now there is other work coming on um, climate change and on climate labor there there is some emerging work on the green transition and what green transition is going to do to labor. So these are like some of the bigger questions. So now we um, open it up to our um, discussants. Um, so shall we just start with tour? Okay, we mix it up. So okay, now we um, open it up to the audience, but may I please request you to keep your comments uh, short and your questions as well. So yes, otherwise Amber will cut you short or she'll give you a look. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Yes. This, this is really interesting and, and, and great stuff. I, I wondered when I heard you talk, it seems like you're all talking about labor that happens under what is under the auspices of what we think of as conservation, as conservationist, conservation projects. What about the labor that could be said to conserve or nurture or care for humans and the rest of nature that is not seen as conservation but still results in something that some might call conservation that is, I guess, also rendered completely invisible uh, in, uh, constantly. Is that also somehow part of this, rendering that more visible or at least exploring the boundary between those two? Thank you. Uh, we take three questions. So, Shine, please. Yeah. So, uh, lovely new project. Uh, so, I have kind of a question that I didn't get the feeling, I mean, what kind of labor profiles are you looking at? It's, it's only managerial, like the rangers, or the populations in the community who are coming into community-based conservation, the urban volunteers who go into different places to do some weird stuff, uh, or some, uh, and some organizational labor in the NGOs. So just give a sense of this labor profile. Uh, I'm, some comments are like, uh, also, please look into the effective labor and the environmentality stuff. I mean, uh, people do labor just for feeling good or kind of uh, the different kind of environmentality that is getting generated there. And why not having people from labor studies in your team? That's one key question from my side. And I'm also sure that you will be looking into gender, ethnic, and the racial dimensions of the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, can we get the next question, please? Yeah. Thanks. Hello. Hi everybody, James Stinson from York University. Uh, so one of the things I'm interested in is the, uh, the increasing role of like large digital technology companies and platforms in conservation. Um, you know, there's a large literature on the way that 
like platform companies like Google or Facebook, for example, take advantage of uh, the unpaid labor of social media users to generate massive profits. And I think you know, as we see these types of organizations becoming more and more involved in, in large-scale biodiversity conservation projects and data generation projects, I think it's interesting to think about the way that uh, conservation workers are being enrolled in um, large-scale projects of accumulation by these large technology companies as well, not just by like tourism companies and, and, and conservation organizations. Um, so that's something I'm interested in, as well as sort of the rescaling and de-skilling that's involved in um, implementing a lot of these uh, digital technologies on the ground in protected areas. Okay, so yeah, good questions. Um, just to respond to the, the question, um, what about labor outside of formal, I guess, big C conservation project sort of settings and, you know, I guess, chains of governance. Um, well, you know, this, pro this project is focused on, I guess, what we would call formal conservation settings. Um, yeah, but of course we're interested in the spectrum of uh, forms of labor and motivations for uh, the sort of work that goes into, um, you know, protecting, regenerating, revitalizing, repairing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the project is specifically focused on uh, more kind of like formal professionalized conservation settings. Um, but, you know, but within those settings, I think, you know, you have, um, you know, you have a juxtaposition between the formal work of conservation, such as, you know, in, you know, either named positions or when people get conscripted to, um, you know, dig the, you know, boundary roads around um, a park or a protected area or something like that. Um, you know, a juxtaposition of that sort of work with, you know, the care work that goes on concurrent with and sometimes despite the, the formal work of protection. Um, and, and that is something we are definitely interested in, is, is the sorts of contradictions around labor and value that um, emerge in the context of different project settings. Trishan, do you want to respond? Yeah, absolutely, uh, James, and we were having this conversation yesterday as well. I mean, just to kind of um, add to that uh, with uh, with the real incidents where um, it's not just Google or these big companies, but even smaller companies that are actually interested in data uh, and conservation data or labor data that is actually gathered by forest workers and frontline forest staff. Um, and yes, there are huge implications of that. And um, I know for a fact that, as I was telling you yesterday, that in India, the M Stripes application was introduced uh, by a biologist or like by biologists or scientists to gather data uh, by this labor force that was already existed, right? So um, there is a lot of uh, interest there by companies that want to convert all of that data into, say, games, for example. There is now games that exist, uh, you know, uh, that are using data from things like smart. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely something that we would want to look at, how, how that, uh, you know, results into this extractive labor. Quick point. Um, I think it's both to Cyan and Jens's questions. Um, I think, yeah, one of the big things that we're trying to do with the project is uh, not constrain ourselves by thinking this is what conservation labor is, but kind of trying to answer that question and being kind of almost the like openly honest of we don't have those categories yet. So I think part of the work using with kind of in-depth case studies and then kind of a broader scale kind of global outlook of essentially trying to map what is you know under how, how however we will define kind of conservation of mapping kind of the landscape of conservation labor. And then getting to your point, uh, Cyan, about a big part of that is who is working in those positions, who occupies those positions, who doesn't, who benefits in what ways along those different lines of difference. Yeah, we were, um, yeah, I think we, were, we used the term, you know, the global conservation labor regime as being what we're interested in actually mapping eventually. Maybe not completely in this project, of course, but. Um, we can all have like big aspirations, right? Yeah, 
we, we left, left the labor question very open and understanding that it's it's a sector that's also going through transitions and, and intersectionality is a very important uh, part of that. Like if we are looking at India, you know, across caste, across gender, across ethnicity, the race question becomes very important. We will look at post-colonial um, settings uh, mostly. So all of those would be taken into consideration. I was wondering now if we have some reflections um, here. And, and there, then. Or if anybody wants, or more questions. Or more questions. Uh, it's an in the bar, so. <laughs> in the bar. OK, I'm still not saying it right. So. Uh, yeah, my question concerns the, the range of labor, of how conservation labor is perceived, because I, you mentioned like Sotokoff's work and this idea of a low-wage conservation labor, but m what I've seen in northeastern Madagascar is mostly that those people who do get jobs in conservation at the parks and are considered in a very privileged position compared to the local communities that they don't come from really, and, 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 and if they do, it's a very privileged position. So I'm just wondering if that's, you know, how to reconcile those two perspectives. Yeah, a very interesting um, project. I think it's really fascinating. I was just thinking if you're actually also taking into consideration maybe like the kind of uh, emotional transition that comes like from uh, the community that have been working more like on a farm, on, uh, uh, you know, maybe doing grazing and other kind of work that actually more related to maybe the environment and then actually this place to do this other kind of labor. What does it mean? And maybe what does it mean mostly for the youth, which might be the one that have been mostly going towards this transition? Yeah. Um, thanks, folks. Um, so I'm really excited to see what comes out of this project. And I think my question is almost a methodological one, maybe, um, about social reproduction and reproductive labor and these gender questions. You know, and again, I'm thinking about at least my, my work you know, in India, like the, in speaking to issues of emotional issues, like the psychological uh, costs of, you know, when these, um, you know, anti-poaching watchers and guards are out for, you know, a month at a time um, without their families and, and what happens in those spaces too. Um, and so I, I guess I'm hoping to hear maybe how you might thinking about, you know, because, you know, uh, th th those issues around social reproduction too and, and how you might conceive of this quickly this sprawls right to really big scale questions so um, yeah that's my big question um, just to uh, to address Anna's question about how do we reconcile um, the fact that you know at one scale you know there is local labor enrolled in conservation whether it be you know um, as guides or uh, guides for scientific teams or tour guides or, you know, whatever, you know, role uh, members of a, you know, like village or population, I'm speaking from Madagascar, my, my experience in Madagascar, you know, might be um, hired to do versus the fact that that is actually a sought after position that's very valuable to local people. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, you can, you can, I don't think there is a contradiction, um, especially in some of the settings that we're dealing with when we're talking about um, Madagascar and many other places where, um, you know, people are systematically excluded from the labor market quite often and have limited opportunities to earn um, cash for reliable amounts of time. Um, you know, yes, I can see that these jobs are quite valuable. That doesn't mean that they're not exploitative and, and that they're not involved in reproducing um, harmful um, social and ecological relationships within broader political economies. So, I mean, labor can be precarious yet sought after. Um, you know, work can be exploitative yet needed. Um, and, I, and I think that is a situation in, in lots of se se settings in Madagascar. Um, Oh, and the question about methods and social reproduction, and yeah, it's heavy. Um, and I think that, yeah, I think I think we're definitely interested um, 
you know, and speaking for myself, you know, I'm extremely interested in those questions. Um, and I think that the way we approach them um, will depend very much on um, the the way we approach research in the different field sites, um, and it's probably just gonna have to be sensitive to our different relationships with the places where we're working, and um, you know, I think you know, an ethnographic approach that's very sensitive to um, people's situations and the sorts of both internal and conflicts with external you know, agents and factors of change going on in communities is gonna be really important. Um, but yeah, these are never like very straightforward issues to deal with and I guess that's a fancy way of saying, we'll see. <laughs> it's an exploratory project, which, so, so there's a lot that we've yet to suss out. Quick point, um, I think, yeah, to Jared, your, your point, but I think also situate the project and, and just kind of research a bit more is there's been a lot of work on rangers um, coming from different fields, criminology, more kind of like, uh, I don't even know what it's called, kind of occupational kind of settings, occupational health and things like that. The biggest piece of work being done by people like Will Moretto and others who work with WWF to do this big survey called Ranger Wellbeing, which is phenomenal work and like massive kind of, um, not entirely global scale, it's really Africa and Asia, but kind of really broad scale work. Um, and that's almost, I see it as kind of like a bit of a building point, whereas a lot of uh, amazing broad scale work, but that kind of also starts the conversation and scratches the surface. And it is very big surveys, quantitative. Uh, so I think part of our motivation was kind of, that's a starting point, there's some really interesting stuff, but coming from our disciplinary methodological background can hopefully help bring some of that more kind of nuance and depth to some of those questions um, and kind of those embodied lived experiences. So hopefully. Um, well, first of all, congratulations with the funding. It's quite impressive to have a uh, plenary organized on a proposal. <laughs> <laughs> or on a project that hasn't started yet. But it's quite clever, you, you know, you get lots of comments and, and, and ideas, I suppose. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, there, so there is some, some, as we've heard, there is some work on, on um, or some research on conservation work by Francis and Libby and others. Uh, but there is, and we haven't heard about tourism as yet. Not so much. There is, and I think there is surprisingly little research on work in, in tourism related to conservation spaces. Um, as Tanya Lee and others have shown, and it was also mentioned here, you know, in the creation of uh, conservation and tourism spaces, people tend to be in the way. Um, so that there is a question of, you know, to what extent are new jobs created? Uh, what type of jobs are created? Who get those jobs? Um, so I would like to see some research on that. Um, you know, there is this win-win story that, uh, you know, uh, it's creating, you know, these spaces are creating jobs. Um, so look into those stories uh, empirically. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I, I've done some work on conservation in East Africa, but I've never actually been interested in the work, uh, you know, labor story. And I, I think it's great that you actually want to go into that. I've just um, a small, perhaps, anecdote to tell from a visit in Maasai Mara and Kenya together with Tekle, who is here. Uh, Tekle is, yeah, in the back, and Connor Kavanaugh. We did uh, some field work in Maasai Mara back in 2018 on conservancies in, in Kenya. And um, we also stayed a couple of nights in a Norwegian-owned camp called Base Camp, um, which is a celebrated safari destination. You know, got, it has got several prizes. It has uh, a, uh, received a lot of uh, positive press in Norway. The owner, Svein Willemsen, is celebrated in Norway as this savior of the local Maasai. Um, 
So it's, it's a complete success story. Um, and it's not bad. They do some social work. They, they, they support the school for Maasai girls and they have some social work. And it's probably one of the best uh, safari camps in Kenya. But still, we, we stayed there a couple of nights and we, we talked with, um, you know, you get a personal waiter. So we had some conversations with that waiter. And um, he told us that he started his day at 4 a.m. And he ended his day at 10 p.m. Uh, he could rest a little bit during, uh, in the middle of the day, but otherwise he had an 18 hours work day. His, his salary was slightly higher than the, um, the, the minimum, minimum wage in Kenya. I think he had a salary of 150 to $200 per month. And he, so he continued working for 18 hours per day for two months. And then he had two weeks off. And this is only one, you know, one interviewee. But I actually wrote a blog about this in, um, in Norwegian, and there was a re re response from the owner, Svein Williams, and he didn't correct me. So it's probably correct. And this is probably one of the best cases of working conditions in the, in the safari business. So I think, uh, you know, looking into this, there is, I haven't seen any literature on this. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't seen any. So go into these, uh, you know, questions. Um, yes, I also uh, was thinking about social reproduction and what sustains the body of the ranger. We talk about uh, well, uh, ranger well-being, but what sustains his, his, his main tool is his body. What sustains his body? And uh, I would like a, a small anecdote. Look at who's cooking. L who's cooking for the ranger? So uh, I work in um, Eastern DRC, which is known as to be the deadliest place in the world to be a ranger. It's kind of nearly romanticized. Like we see, uh, unfortunately, we see every month uh, uh, a news message that a ranger got shot in, in Virunga. It's, 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 and these people are giving their life, sacrificing their life to, to save uh, wildlife. Uh, talking to them, they don't want to sacrifice their life. They want to be... They want to stay alive. So if you look, um, a small anecdote on what we don't see behind the spectacle of militarized conservation, and that is this is the only option. And it only creates, we are training new men on the front line of war. So new rangers are coming. Rangers are dying, new rangers are coming. But what is an alternative to this cycle? Um, I spoke, it's a small anecdote about uh, Lucy. Lucy is a woman. Um, she lost her husband. He was a park ranger. Uh, he died. She became a widow. She moved to another village uh, to be out of that, that context. And uh, she started uh, a new restaurant because she needed to sustain her family. She started a small restaurant. Then in her small restaurant, everyone is, is coming there. Rangers are eating there, but also the local population are eating there. And then one evening she hears four guys talking about planning an attack on um, the ranger post close by and how they could um, how they could talk with the local Mai Mai rebel group to kind of enlist them, which is kind of fluid. And they were talking about how they could uh, prepare this attack. And Lucy was hearing that as a widow uh, of another park guard. And then she was thinking, what can I do? Shall I go to the ranger post and, and alarming them? But then she's like, then I lose my position in this community. What can I do? So what, did, what she did, she, she went to the local church, she went to the, to the priest there and said, can you help me? I don't want to be identified, but I know these, these men are planning this attack and I understand their grievances, but we should stop this cycle. And together with the church, and this, they, had a, they had a conversation and they started to have a kind of a process. And without identifying the woman, there was a, a, a dialogue between the local ranger post and, and, and the wider community without identifying the men planning the attack. Uh, in that place, now over the last, at least, at least in that part in, around Vrunga National Park, there is no deadly attack. This is invisible, invisible conservation work. It also shows that demilitarized conservation is possible. You don't have to militarize, there are ways to de-escalate. 
And um, it's a small anecdote, but it's about the social reproductive labor that, that widows are engaged in. They do this work. They, they, they are faced with these forms of violence. And I often think, look at who's cooking. Who's cooking? And, and who cooks for whom? And they know a lot. Shall I? Um, <clears throat> I'm Lagato from Wageningen University. And um, I think as you were speaking, some of the thoughts that came to mind was, you know, you, uh, Francis, I think you mentioned cases. So what are these cases? Where are they located? And I ask because, of course, nuance, context matters. But um, I come from, uh, you know, studying private conservation more explicitly. And I know that the experiences of labor in state-owned parks can be fundamentally different to what's happening um, in privately controlled nature reserves. So, you know, in pursuing the project, you know, what are the kind of labor regimes that are unfolding in private spaces versus um, publicly owned um, uh, protected areas? And like Esther and others on the floor as well, of course, the first thing that came to mind was also social reproduction, especially in relation to the kind of work that's coming out from feminist scholars in relation to the crisis of social reproduction, and we're seeing that across the world, but more so especially in these marginal areas where you know, the state is not quite present. You know, Reserves, if you're talking about private reserves, are exceptionally big, often functioning as a state of, on their own. Um, and I think you know, also, yeah, just thoughts that were triggered, if you're starting to think about you know, the kind of changes that conservation brings about in terms of um, land use, but what that means for labor in the landscape. Um, in the South African context, I think the work of Tariro and et al, Femke Brunt and, and others who looked at game farms in the Karoo, but KZN as well looked at how conversion from, yeah, from commercial agriculture to game farm has had an impact on you know, labor regimes in, in those spaces. But, of course, we are, things have changed significantly since then, so it can be built on. But yeah, I think a, an exciting project that is timely given the incredible work that conservation workers do, but are often quite um, unrecognized um, in those spaces. And then, you a last thought <laughs> would be in relation to volunteers or voluntourism. Um, this is not, I think that's, voluntourism has been written about a bit, but not in terms of it being a labor question. And I know some reserves in Namibia really depend on volunteers. They depend on volunteers spending money to come um, participate in, you know, capping or coloring a lion, those, those kind of what are seen as marginal activities. But those, that's work, right? And what does it mean when you have a whole conservation NGO running on voluntourism? Um, and volunteers that also pay to participate. And if you start thinking about value, what is the kind of value that these young, white, <laughs> aspirant uh, Americans and Europeans, what kind of value are they producing on the African continent? I think those are uh, very important questions to, to ask. Um, yeah, that, that is it for me. Uh, I'm Libby Lundstrom from Boise State University. Um, congratulations, this is a really cool project. And I have to be honest, when I first heard about it, my initial thought beyond it's awesome was like, why didn't someone do this before? Because <laughs> it's so fundamental and so important. So um, a big congratulations. So the, the comments that I've been thinking of is everyone's been talking and including a lot of the, the questions and the stuff that we've learned throughout the last few days. Um, the first one is, and I'm glad someone mentioned this, the 30 by 30, that this project will only become more important as conservation areas grow. Um, another thing I was thinking of, we had a really interesting panel yesterday uh, that Annette and Jared had organized with conservation practitioners. And one of the questions that came up in that panel was the question around urbanization. Like, what does it mean that urban areas are growing around parks? Because I think, and I'm guilty of this, but. I often think about like the village next to a national park and it's like these idealized thatched roof hut. But that's not the reality. The reality is that urban areas are growing and that has profound implications for labor, I think, about where labor's coming from, what demands are urban areas making on parks. Um, and one of the insights yesterday from one of the practitioners was that some of the concerns about urban areas next to parks, yes, it is about human-wildlife conflict, but it's also about labor. 
people wanting jobs. And so to think about these demographic transitions, are, that's probably the wrong word, but you know what I mean? Changes to populations um, around parks, um, how does that impact labor dynamics and, and what people aspire to through parks, that people who aren't tourists. Um, I think that's really key here. I was also thinking about labor migration, and this came up, I think, today, um, where a lot of, especially in more highly securitized contexts, um, park organizations are hiring rangers from outside, both because they're concerned about corruption, but they're also concerned about um, the the potential impacts on the families of rangers. Um, so there's some benevolence behind that as well. But so we're seeing new forms of labor migration uh, with park rangers as well. So I think that would be an interesting dynamic to look at. Um, two more quick points. The question of labor brings me back to this classical political ecology question about nature as produced and national parks as produced spaces that are um, protecting wildlife and ecological processes for sure, but they're also produced in a particular way that appeals to tourist desires, and it's labor that makes that happen. And to think about the ways in which conservation labor um, might resist that, or might create new types of spaces, or might uh, play into that. But to think of going back to like super classic political ecology questions, I think, but asking the question about labor, that does not happen by accident. Um, and what are the practices behind that? Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention was about, and Francis had mentioned this, this is absolutely key, I think. The conservation, when you look at labor and foreground labor, you really begin to understand that conservation is a very embodied practice. This is about the bodies of labor, doing labor work, and, and not just rangers, but rangers are really key here. And I think that allows us to get at these questions of nuance and contradiction. I think these questions that political ecologists are really interested in and you know the where you have um, a ranger for example who um, is making sacrifice and is engaging in acts of care but might simultaneously be engaging in acts of oppression. Um, but to think about that those sort of contradictions I think are um, are really fundamental here as well and I do think it's the site of labor, the site of the body laboring um, where we can maybe see that in a way that we can't. It gives us a different type of window into those dynamics. So, so do I have to walk all the way down to Dan? <laughs> Thank you Libby. I've got uh, three very uh, quick points to make. Um, and Wesha, you said that this was the fastest email return from me saying yes to your... I want you all to know that this is it's not because my finger slipped on the keyboard and I accidentally hit return too quickly. Um, no, I said yes because it's a great team of people. And it, as uh, Libby said, uh, this is new and important and did make me think, why haven't more people done more of this before? Because this matters. I was glad, really glad to see Janice's name mentioned because she did come up, was working on this at an early, early stage and working in relative isolation. Um, there is some fantastic work coming out from um, a, a colleague called Magna Meta, um, also who was at Sheffield, who has an article coming out in Current Anthropology at some point in the future. It's, it's been accepted, they're bringing the comments together. Um, but she worked closely with both the conservation laborers in the Sundarbans and also the people who they were policing. And she's bringing, doing some, has some fascinating perspectives on the relationships um, between the two. But my last point, because how, how fun it was and the people working on it, but, but the last point is um, back to what Jens was saying about the breadth of conservation. Because for a long time, I, um, I've, I have been looking at conservation as, and, and, and others, I think, quite a lot of us do this. We, we think, see of conservation as, as something that, that happens in, in, in projects or in, in parks or in particular policies. And the logic of so much of our critique is actually what could count and should count as conservation is much broader. And it's not necessarily called conservation. It's much more mundane and everyday. But which has considerable implications for a study of conservation labor. Because if, as, as Libby said, 30 by 30 means a lot more stuff is going to be tr tried to be labeled as conservation, and they're going to miss lots. I think there's quite a lot of conservation labor in this room. We would include the researchers, the political ecologists amongst it, which really makes it broad. But thanks. Oh. 
I got a mic, yeah. Uh, congratulations for this project. Uh, sounds very exciting and also happy to see some familiar faces working in it. Uh, my question is about the naming of the project. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the various types of labor that you'll be looking at about. Uh, but we are leaving the category of conservation very intact. To me, this project sounds more like labor and conservation areas than actually about understanding that conservation itself could happen in areas which are not seen as protected areas. So, so it, could, it could also take us to areas where there's no forest administration, where, is, where there are no rangers per se, but there are communities. So in that sense, we are following the very hegemonic definition of conservation by linking conservation and labor together, rather than saying labor and conservation areas. Does that make sense? Yes, but it doesn't give us as good an acronym. <laughs> you start with the acronym, right? Yes. I just wanted to just a quick rejoinder to that. Um, I kind of disagree. I don't think that we mean to, uh, I mean, just because it's called conservation labor, it, it's meant to be in protected areas or where there is forest administration. There's enough conservation work that indigenous communities do. There are now the Forest Rights Act has been deployed all over India in many places. So we are looking at those forms of labor as well. And I mean, I, 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 for me, conservation is not just a state. It is also indigenous communities that are doing conservation. So. Uh, yeah, just a kind of response to it. Um, I was wondering, <clears throat> in the conceptualization of your projects, if you had turned the gaze yeah. on yourselves at all and considered the labor that your research participants will be doing for you for conservation research and how that fits into the ethics of the project. Yes, hello. I would be interested in what also uh, Tor was talking about, which I would call the enchantment of conservation labor, you know, in projects that it's coming like this, 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 um, this promise of, you know, uh, actually coping with labor shortages in, in the global south and how, how this is sort of framed. I would uh, love to actually understand uh, how this is made. And then there's a second thing. Um, conservation labor creating internal conflicts. We know of a lot about a lot of projects that actually creates internal co conflicts within local communities uh, who are actually then also engaged in conservation labor. We, we just heard an example, an indirect example, but um, that would be an additional thing which I would be interested in if you take uh, this up. No, yeah, just to respond um, to several things. Um, but yeah, building on your last point, yeah, that's absolutely true. And um, yeah, I think we need to bear in mind that um, you know often when we're when we're talking about like what I call like big C conservation, um, you know when you know when you do have consultations going on in advance of um, projects being established and you know boundaries being drawn and things like that, um, you often have promises made. Um, of you know lucrative jobs, educational opportunities, skills training. I mean, you get the same thing in the mining sector. Um, but then, too often, when when things happen, you do have you know these um, outside hiring, uh, and the excuse is always something like, "Well, that's where the skills are. You know, there aren't the skills locally that we need." And it's like, "Well, what about that offer of training?" But then, at the same time, like within families, within you know among neighbors, like you have you know, conflicts over, you know, somebody having gotten the job and, you know, there just aren't enough to go around because, you know, oh, the budget's, you know, too small and they don't have the right skills, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, these are, these are problems that come up all over the world all the time when we're talking about conservation, especially in, um, you know, settings where people are more cash poor and more desiring of those sort of jobs. Um, I think um, back to the issue of social reproduction. I really liked um, what you say. Look who's cooking. Um, I also I also um, think that you know methodologically speaking, getting to Jared's question again, looking looking at the source of any claimed co-benefits because you know when we're talking about conservation, we're not just talking about you know big parks and conservancies. We're talking about carbon forestry and things like that that are marketed often um, or have value added on the basis of co-benefits that are claimed by the project. 
and those are usually produced by um, local NGOs or you know other other groups um, who who give charisma to the project. Like a lot of times, you know, you'll have a woman's group, you know, that's that's benefiting and contributing or volunteering their labor to you know plant seedlings or you know any number of things that get that get claimed on as you know delivering development. But ironically, it's people's own labor that are actually doing these things. Um, and not something that is coming from, you know, any sort of steering group or um, international NGO. Um, what? Methods. Oh, yeah, and there was a, the question of case studies. Um, because this is an exploratory project and we're really just kind of like putting a new lens on something that is, you know, the bread and butter of political ecology, um, and, and what we're already doing. Uh, we, we do plan to work in our uh, field sites where we have long-term relationships with collaborators um, and with people who are involved in um, conservation work um, and as, a, you know, as a starting point and then build from there, um, particularly if we uh, develop a follow-on project that expands. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah, labor, labor is a really exciting lens to put on these issues because not not only because there are so many classic questions that need to be revisited in the contemporary context um, of of yeah just big big changes that are happening everywhere in crazy different ways um, but yeah because labor labor is one of those concepts um, like value like a lot of other things it's like the rug in the big Lebowski it really brings the room together um, <laughs> It, it's so many things are, part, are, are brought together through asking questions about labor. I'm just so excited about this project and where it goes eventually. And just to very quickly add, something um, that kind of came up on, on and off is like, what does uh, political ecology do to policy? Where do we situate ourselves in relation to policy? Because we talk about scales, right? And this labor project is definitely all, you know, different kind of um, scales. And that's something we thought we would also be doing is that so far the way we have looked at people um, within these conservation spaces, very broadly defined. It's been work, it's been livelihoods, it's been community participation, community volunteerism. And we thought if there was a way to in some ways go beyond um, the empirics or empirical categories to kind of um, streamline things to also be able to influence the policy. Because end of the day, impact is also important on the people who are um, facing these uh, hardships. And that's why, as uh, just to reiterate, we will be studying areas that we are familiar with, but on the side, also try to develop some kind of a global survey, if possible, to kind of do a typology of what conservation labor means. And just to like you know understand you know across um, these axes, intersectionalities, geographical context, and um, uh, yeah. Um, I might offer a question, and then we've got Catherine and, and Jens. Um, just thinking about these questions from a South African space. Sorry, I'm getting some strange feedback there. Um, it's an interesting question to think about labor here, and, and in particular in a people parks context, how labor becomes a parad paradigm of engagement, and how is it governmentalized, and you know, what are its limitations or alternatives. So here, I mean, when you hear about four million people around the Kruger Park, it's not a question of displacement, it's an imperative to engage, and we heard that from the conservationists yesterday. Tens to hundreds of thousands of people around other places like Lefleu and Folosi. And then conservationists are almost um, obliged then to, pro or, or are looked to, to provide jobs. And that can be a, a complicated politics. Um, and there's, yeah, there's all sorts of examples of the kinds of conflict, patronage, those sorts of things. And it almost becomes a zero sum game. You have it or you don't. Uh, you have a job, you don't have a job. And it can become governmentalized. So here in, in South Africa, there's hundreds of thousands of people who are employed in short-term contracts, which are termed work opportunities, so that on spreadsheets, they can show that there's you know, not just one job a year, but four work opportunities in cycles of three months each. And in municipalities, uh, within departments, you know, those, are, those are things that matter. Of course, there's good work that's done, expanded public works projects, uh, working for water, working on fire, all of these things do great work, but there's real questions around, you know, transitory labor, 
um, temporary labor and how do people transition out of it and what happens to them when they fall out of these programs. But then I think what's missing is also these questions of unions. What about unionization? Yeah. You know, I haven't heard that at all. What about collective bargaining, dialectical materialism, these kinds of questions? Um, in Tereiro's seat on Monday, we had Musa Chamane from Groundwork, who's been really instrumental in the South African Waste Pickers Association and formalizing them as a union with collective bargaining rights. I mean, it's a struggle, but that's something that in South Africa is imperative. You know, that we have a fairly fragmented at the moment set of trade unions, but can be vociferous and really, really important in our, in our politics. So that's something that I would like to, to see developed. And then finally, just about alternatives. When I speak to community conservation officers in our contexts, you know, the, the pressure to provide jobs between 10 different traditional authorities around the areas and then sometimes being held hostage as a sort of bargaining tool to, you know, say, well, we need more jobs this side. With that zero-sum element around jobs being the, the response or conservation ending poverty around parks. It's not, unfortunately, going to happen. So what about alternative approaches that are more around resilience, around helping people with risk mitigation, around human wildlife conflict and coexistence, instead of putting so much pressure on these community conservation officers and their labor to, to come up with these impossible sort of solutions. And rather, it's the relationships with people in parks and helping each other out, not creating too many expectations and actually managing that complicated politics of engagement that isn't encapsulated in the, the labor category. Yeah. Can I go, Catherine, and then, yes. Yeah, thanks, great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that on board. We'll organize a conference. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's become clear we need to organize a conference on this. Uh, yeah, actually, I feel a little bit like um, we're all sitting here saying, hey, I've been thinking about these ideas. You should think about them, too, and incorporate them into your project. But um, you, you kind of asked for it. So. Yeah, I think you all should keep thinking about those things. And <laughs> so we will, too. Speaking of which, um, I, I think it's really important to talk about chat GDP, or G G B P T, right? Yeah. Yeah, GDP. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. Um, but I, I, I th I'm, I'm joking, but I think that, um, you know, those of us who have been working on conservation technology are thinking about labor in different ways. And, um, you know, so there's the labor of the computer programmer, the game designer, but there's also, I think, as a lot of these games, let's say, let's go to gamification, are using citizen science. You're thinking of the everyday citizen there's child labor involved in terms of um, the way in which artificial intelligence is taking the ways in which people are using games or using other technologies and, and, and turning that into a commodity. Um, so I think that um, I'm interested in the ways in which technology is reshaping the conditions of labor and how that contributes to value, but also how it's creating conditions for the absence of labor and what does that mean um, for the way in which we think about labor and conservation. So, not that your project should take that on as well, but I think um, it is something for us to be thinking about in political ecology more broadly. Thanks, no, I think it's more or less been, been said, but if we stay within this framing of uh, big C conservation, I also thought that at least in the context where I've been finding myself uh, working a little bit in Eastern Africa, I think a major labor implication of conservation is this question of protecting yourself from pests and from <laughs> elephants, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it hasn't really been enumerated or enumerated yet. And we're still finding ourselves in these debates with conservationists who argue that conservation is win, win, win for everyone. But the labor cost of protecting yourself, at least from elephants in an East African context, is just enormous. So getting back to that and also maybe thinking about in your project, where are the big, depending on where you want to cut it, where, where does labor really matter for a lot of people? And are there you know, a risk that if you're focusing on rangers, et cetera, that you invisibilize an enormous group for which this, this question matters a lot? It's not easy, but, um, but maybe a starting point, because we've had so many really interesting ways of unpacking this question today would be a more conceptually oriented piece that you should put out, because I think there could be so much, um, you could put out so many directions for research that others could pick up upon, so, uh, but 
wonderful project and uh, looking forward to seeing the outcomes very soon. Yeah, just quick responses. Um, I agree with Kathleen totally that I think that's something that we should be looking at at all. But at the same time, um, from experience and talking to uh, frontline forest staff in India, I, it seems highly unlikely that these technologies will actually ever replace boots on the ground. Um, at the moment, at least, it's practically impossible for these technologies to monitor the same, uh, same in the, the, in the, the labor process in the same ways in which uh, the labor actually does. So um, there's, I think we still need to be working on that, but I do feel like that, that there's still time for that to happen. Um, yeah, you know, there's something uh, that came up in my PhD was uh, the concept of labor precarity increasing due to increase in animal populations in many of these protected areas. And that is something of a taboo subject with conservationists. Uh, you know, they don't want to talk about how uh, tiger populations increasing or elephant population increasing causing uh, human wildlife conflict. Um, and in India, particularly, uh, the most number of ranger deaths or frontline forest staff deaths happen because of elephant attacks or rhino attacks or tiger attacks, not by uh, you know ambushes by poachers or anything. But it's projected that way. Uh, so there's something definitely there that we should be looking at. Uh, just a final comment to kind of piece together certain things and something that we've not mentioned and I feel that it is important for me to mention is that in India, particularly in South Asia, not just India, uh, division of labor uh, or anything to do with labor, you cannot, uh, you know, not engage with issues of caste and caste segregation. Uh, if within forest staff as well, uh, you know, Esther was saying that who's cooking for the uh, forest guard. Uh, I would go a step further and say who's washing clothes of the forest guard. And it's normally uh, a forest watcher who comes from a lower caste community. Uh, caste, you know, maybe a dhobi caste whose their occupation is to wash clothes. Uh, so these are questions that we need to be grappling with as well, uh, engaging more with caste scholars, uh, especially when we are looking at uh, labor. And then when we um, start, we also will have field sites in Eastern Africa or Southern Africa, then the question of race also becomes uh, very uh, pertinent. And the thing is, we are not really uh, going to study only rangers. That's really was never uh, going to be the focus. I mean, Francis and I have worked on rangers, uh, Trishanda as well, so uh, forest guards, but we really want to also go to people who are affected by conservation in myriad different ways, whether it's through um, uh, expansion of conservation areas, whether it's through other uh, effective conservation measures because of uh, 30 by 30 and uh, such things. So in different ways, and that's something I think we will also be um, conceptually developing and working on because there are different uh, phenomena happening side by side. And what Tour mentioned, uh, studying tourism industry and this expansion of tourism as the win-win, that was very much put in as an important sector that we were uh, we will definitely uh, be studying so it is just about you know limited resources maximizing and scaling uh, it up uh, yeah, um, thanks Anusha and I think you've spoken a bit to what I wanted to say about the I think there's a uh, there's been a mention that it's a new project and I think um, you guys are building on a lot of scholarship some of which you have done yourself. So I think a bit of caution there to suggest that it's new because you're invisibilizing your own work that you've done in conservation. You're invisibilizing the work of Tafazwa, who's also left. You're invisibilizing the work of Ivan, who's here. So I think you guys have worked on conservation. So you're, perhaps the notion of new should be unpacked a bit as to you know what is new that you're adding to the work that you and many others have already been doing within the conservation space. And your own PhD, Lerato. <laughs> So I think we have to um, wrap up now, but you know, but the thing is, you know, we really welcome, you know, we are just starting off and yeah, and we will also be hiring a postdoctoral researcher on the project who will move to Norway and be based uh, with me in uh, Bergen. It rains there, but it's still nice. Um, so <laughs> yes, we'll advertise that soon, but uh, thank you so much for being here, for being so um, active in the discussion and please keep the thoughts flowing and uh, yes, thank you so much. Thanks so much everyone for a, a provocative session. It's, not, it's rare to have us in a position in a plenary to be engaging with work to come and not to come with answers but to, to point out what we, what we should be asking. So I've really enjoyed that. Um, something else that's unique to Pollen, and this is a plug for you to please come back to the final biennial general meeting. That's our final plenary. 
um, is that we've got something unique which Dan has run across all four of these um, pollen bi um, biennial events that we have, and this is the moling uh, team. And they have been, you don't know it, but they've been in all of your sessions observing, talking amongst themselves. They've been doing all the tweeting as well, so thank you very much for that. But they're looking at cross-cutting themes, they're discussing what's been talked about, what hasn't been talked about, what they find most striking. And my, one of my favorite parts of these conferences is when they present back. Um, and that's what's gonna happen. They're gonna tell us what we said and engage with, with that material. So they, we will kick off the, the BGM with a presentation from Dan and, and the mole, some of whom are more conspicuous than others, Jess. Uh, we know who you are. 